Copernicus Marine Service Training for Ocean Color. As you know, my name is Silvia Pardo. I am an Earth Observation Scientist at Plymouth Marine Laboratory, Plymouth, in the United Kingdom. And I'm here today to help you explore some of the ocean color products that are available through the Copernicus Marine Service catalog. This is a part two of a three part series on ocean color. So please feel free to go back to part one if you need a refresher on data structure uh, on how opening, extraction, and visualizing the data. I have included a link to part one in here in case you need a refresher. So also a quick reminder that we are gonna use this uh, Jupyter notebook environment. Uh, to run the code, you only have to click on the uh, play button in this top panel. You can stop the execution of any any uh, boxes of code uh, by pressing the uh, stop button. You can also modify both the text and the code boxes by double click clicking on the box you're interested in. So, for example, if I double click here, I can access the source uh, for the for this data. Sorry, for this text uh, box, and then you can run it and you can go back to the normal view of it. <clears throat> then we can add new cells uh, just using the plus button uh, on the top panel. You can save your changes if you make any changes to the Jupyter notebook, and you can even uh, chose, uh, choose uh, the new, uh, a new notebook from this, um, another top but, uh, but panel. Um, that will allow you to create a new Jupyter notebook from scratch. So uh, during the session, we will use Copernicus data to study the intensity and the location, the duration and the timing of phytoplankton blooms. We will learn how to tell if a bloom is really a bloom or just a regional feature. We will also learn how to extract an average data to build a time series for daily and monthly chlorophyll concentration for a region, and we will use this to study the seasonal cycle of phytoplankton. So phytoplankton as chlorophyll concentration as a proxy uh, respond to changes in the physical environment very quickly. In the North Atlantic, these changes uh, present a distinct seasonality and they are mostly determined by light and nutrient availability. The seasonal cycles of increasing blooming and decreasing chlorophyll are well known, but phytoplankton blooms also occur in response to events that change the chemistry of uh, the ocean water. For example, one of the most common events in this area is the deposition of Saharan dust. Uh, which contains a range of uh, wine nutrients that act as fertilizer for phytoplankton. And here we have a spectacular example of Saharan dust in this image, which was acquired on the 8th of April 2011 by the European Space Agency satellite Embisat. And here uh, in this image, uh, the dust, the Saharan dust, is traveling north and is triggering uh, plankton blooms on its way such as this massive and intricate uh, phytoplankton bloom of the western coast of Portugal and Spain. As we did uh, in part one, uh, we will begin by setting up our environment and data paths. We will use the following libraries. We have seen some of them already, but at least I think at least the three, the last three ones uh, will be probably new for you. We have the string module, so that one over here that we're importing and using the import uh, function. So the string module contains a number of functions that are useful for string operations. In particular, we will use it to define a string template and perform uh, simple string substitutions within the template. For example, uh, in particular, we will create a template for the file name of the monthly products for the Atlantic region. As we saw when we were talking about naming conventions in part one, most of the file names are fixed uh, for certain products. So we can easily define a template that leaves some parts of the file name, file name fixed, 
such as the name of the area, which is, is going to be fixed for a region, and defines placeholders for the variable bits, such as the date, for example, or the, chlor uh, the name of the uh, chlorophyll algorithm. Then we have the uh, glob module, which is very useful when it's used uh, together with the template. And this will allow us to identify and list the files with a file name that matches a certain pattern, and we will define that pattern using the template. And last but not least, uh, we have the math module, which is probably self-explanatory. And uh, this module contains functions that allow allows us to perform high precision mathematical operations. Again, as we did in the previous in the previous in part one in the previous exercise, we will need to tell the system the names of the files that we are going to use and where the system can find those files. So to do this, we will create uh, the same kind of uh, root directory uh, variable over here using the, the well-known uh, get uh, current working directory uh, function. And uh, we will assign it to, to this variable, as we said, and then we will use it further down with the join functions to define the path to our data files. Remember that all the files that you need for this practical session should be accessible already for you uh, within the Jupyter Notebook environment. And you can always use data uh, that you have downloaded from the catalog onto your computer. But uh, if you do that, you will have to either put data in the right place, that's within this structure, or maybe change uh, the definitions for these two variables in here. So scrolling further down, we have a look at the data sets we are going to use to detect our phytoplankton bloom. The data sets we are going to use for this exercise is, are quite similar to, the, to those that we use for part one. In particular, we will keep using the Atlantic reprocessed chlorophyll data sets at level three and level four, but we will be extracting data from different dates. Remember that you can learn more about the products by uh, following the links that we have uh, included here and, and those links will uh, lead you to the product user manuals and product quality documents for these products. We already used for process data sets in the previous and in, in part one in the previous exercise, but we will have easily learned how to visualize data, how to extract the data, learn more about the data structure by using near real time data because we were more interested in the data structure rather than the actual values of the ocean color, fifth, uh, ocean color variables. For this exercise, on the other hand, we will be setting the basis for actual scientific analysis. So the values of the chlorophyll, the accuracy of the, of the chlorophyll uh, product uh, is important. And we need data sets that help us minimize the signal to noise ratio. So uh, some of some reprocessed data sets are uh, sometimes called climate grade data sets, uh, and that only happens when they reach a demonstrable quality, and uh, usually when they are able to provide a measure of the uncertainty in the chlorophyll retrievals or chlorophyll and whatever variable you're looking at, by, for example, comparison with in situ data. And the, uh, I have to say that the reprocessed data sets uh, that we, we uh, produce for the uh, Copernicus Marine Service do fit this, uh, this uh, description. So why is this so important? Well, the detection of long-term climate change trends and trend point chains relies on the existence of really long continuous records, in this case, ocean colored records, because only if you have a consistent, long, coherent uh, data record, you can tease the footprint of climate change out from the seasonal and the interannual components of the signal. So it has been argued that the existing remote sensing records are already mature enough to detect the climate change signature in some variables such as sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, and primary productivity for some of the regions, not for the entire globe. So for this reason, it is critical to use climate grade datasets when doing analysis uh, on long-term trends and variability for any biogeochemical variable in general. So going back to our files, our code and datasets, here we have defined a list of daily files uh, acquired, uh, acquired at the end of March 2013 
when we know that a phytoplankton bloom was taking place. You might remember that I have already shown you an image of this bloom in the previous exercise. In particular, this was an image acquired on the 20th of March 2013 by the CVF sensor, where we saw how high concentration chlorophyll pigments translated to bright green waters. We can also see the same kind of effect in here, in the MBSAT image, uh, in the wake of the Saharan, and the, this cloud of Saharan dust. As always, we define uh, well, the, the file, the, a list of file names, and then we can start uh, loading the files, accessing the data inside them. So for all this, we will use uh, the X-Array open dataset file that we uh, function with that we imported at the beginning. We will load the file to create a new dataset. So these are the new datasets in here. And this is a good time that to mention that we are using the simplest possible argument configuration for the open dataset function. Um, but the function, this function actually has a lot of options, such as uh, an option called uh, drop variables uh, that, for example, uh, stops some of the variables, a subset of variables, to be uh, loaded when you call uh, when you when you make a call such as this one. And there is another option, for example, that's very useful called the scale, um, sorry, mask and scale, which allows us to mask empty array positions and scale the non-mask values by multiplying them by a scale factor and adding an offset value. So feel free to stop here for a while and maybe I'll have a look at the documentation online, um, try these options out. And keep in mind that depending on your objectives for this workshop, you might need a slightly a more complicated versions of this, this course over here to use open dataset in the future. Because we don't have a lot of time, uh, we are going to cheat a little bit. And instead of chasing the bloom across the datasets, I can tell you that the bloom peaked on the 20th of March of, uh, 2003. So let's have a look at the daily chlorophyll for this date. And here we have extracted the chlorophyll, the latitude and the longitude variables for our um, daily chlorophyll data set, level three daily chlorophyll data set for this date. And we have, as we did um, in the previous exercise, we assign them to the corresponding variable names, we will, which we will use for plotting. We can now create a chlorophyll map for the date. So that's what the next um, sequence of, of code instructions is doing. As, um, as we did in the previous exercise, when we learn how to visualize data, we will first set up an empty map. Then we will create a coordinate mess for, and, and, and use it to plot our data. And then we will add some uh, formatting uh, that will make the, the plot nicer. So line by line, to just as a reminder of how these uh, plotting sequences go, uh, we first define a, a projection and we assign it to a custom variable name. We initialize a figure object. Uh, we can define uh, both the size and the resolution of the figure. We create, uh, um, we add some access to the empty plot using this instruction over here which takes uh, the projection as an argument. Uh, then we add the coastlines uh, in the line uh, resolution and the color that we specify here. Um, then um, remember that we are going to use uh, the pseudo color uh, mess function to plot our data in which uh, each data point is drawn as a cell for the plot color according to its data value. And we will need to provide the usual three arrays to this function. Uh, and we will also use the variable minimum and the variable maximum to specify the ranges of values that the uh, color map will cover. And uh, once we can do that, we can put some formatting in place. Uh, we use uh, grid lines. Um, we can tell uh, the instruction, the function that the, the grid lines are going to be labeled. We can also specify the format of the grid lines. Remember that uh, labels will be drawn on the four size, uh, size of the figure by default, but we can override that and 
particularly here we are deleting the labels on the top and right hand uh, sides of the of the figure you can see already how those labels are no longer present in the in the data set and then we can uh, where are we here then we can always specify the style of the of the labels and these next two um, lines of code are very handy so um, here we look at what we are doing is defining the geographical extent of the map by defining by specifying a maximum and a minimum values for the x and y axis so those are these two uh, functions called set x limit and set set y limit um, so this is another way to zoom into a region uh, in, of interest in, instead of having to redefine the extent of the data set as we did in, in the previous exercise by defining a coordinate box and extracting the data in that box we just redefine the access limits so this has some obvious advantages we don't have to go through the hassle of identifying the coordinate indices that define our region of interest and then going through the motions of having to apply these indexes to obtain a, slide, a slice sorry, of the original array but on the other hand, if this is fantastic for plotting, but if you're going to perform any statistic analysis on a data set, I will recommend you friends perform some data extraction as we did in, in the previous exercise using the slicing technique that, that we employ there. Going back to our plotting, uh, we uh, so you already know what the last three lines do. We are basically adding a color bar that shows the correspondence between um, the color scale and the chlorophyll values. So this will have the usual attributes uh, defining the uh, orientation of the color bar, uh, the size of the color bar, the, where the ticks uh, for different values are going to appear. And then we can label those ticks and finally include a label for the color bar. And last but not least, uh, we can use uh, PyPlot Show to, to produce this beautiful map. Um, so this is our data, so daily chlorophyll concentration map for the 20th of March 2013. If you have never seen a phytoplankton bloom as seen from an ocean color product, you might be surprised about how much structure uh, there is in this image. So how sharp the changes between high and low concentrations are. So things like this structure in here. So as usually we'll have some sharp uh, straight lines in the data and these show the boundaries for different streams of data coming from different sensors. And we also have the, this irregular shapes where there is no data, where we have cloud cover or a failure in the retrieval algorithm. But the most striking bits are these vortex-like uh, structures, which are called eddies. As you know, uh, there are mm, several major currents, uh, current systems across the oceans, and they are well known to oceanographers. And these are due to gravity, the global wind uh, systems, and also variation in water density in different parts of the ocean, mainly due to differences in temperature and salinity. So. We have those huge currents that most stay, stay the same uh, most of the time, but then on occasion we find that a large mass of water spins off for the, for the current system. And it forms this kind of whirlpool pattern that can be uh, kilometers wide and can travel quickly at great distances from the origin. So there are uh, obviously regions uh, where those eddies are more frequent. Um, either, for example, because we have a, a mass of land in the way of, of a stream of water or because we have two masses of water coming up together. And it is, in, the, in any case, whatever the, the reason uh, of, of the uh, regional appearance of the cities, they are usually very dynamic and their shape and intensity vary a lot from day to day. But some of them can persist for months within a region. And this edit also provides you another nice uh, example of uh, potential synergy between the biogeochemical variables about, available in the Copernicus Marine Catalog. And 
in here I have um, kind of set up a, a raise a question and set up a small exercise where I suggest that you create uh, the salinity and sea surface temperature maps for the same date and see if they match uh, the eddies and the other structures you can see in the chlorophyll map. So we could now ask ourselves um, how did the bloom change from day to day. So conveniently, we have already identified uh, a weeks, week, week or so worth of daily data files around the date when the blue peak in our region of interest, and we have already loaded the um, <clears throat> the uh, chlorophyll. Uh, we have already opened the, the data sets, so we have them loaded in these variables in here. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, so basically these data sets are, are, are now ready basically to, to be plotted. And that's exactly what I'm going to do in this box over here. So we will use a new function, new for us function called subplot to visualize a range of dates in the same plot. So um, Subplot is part of the uh, matplotlib pyplot library and each instance, so here is how we call subplot function, and each one of these uh, instances of subplot adds a subplot to the current figure. So the important thing to remember when calling the subplot function is knowing how to specify the position of the sub subplot within the figure. So you have different figures and you want to know where each one of those figures goes. And here we have uh, used one of the a variety of options to specify the position of the subplot within the figure. So that's uh, what those three numbers <coughs> at the beginning of, of the uh, function call means. So um, we provide three integers representing the number of rows, the number of columns, and then an absolute index. And the subplot will take the index position of the grid defined by the number of columns and the number of rows. Um, just uh, as, a, as a pointer, the index starts at 1, not the 0, and it starts from the upper left corner and increases to the right, so that way. So what we are doing in here is to define four different subplots. So all of them, as you can see, all of them have uh, the same numbers for the first two integers. So this means that our figure is going to have two columns in two rows. And then we have the third integer, which defines uh, the absolute index. So the first plot has an index of 1. It will be situated in the top left corner. Then the second subplot have will have uh, an absolute index of 2 and will be situated in the top right corner and going down the third and fourth subplots so that's the fourth for example same number of rows, same number of columns and it will uh, be fourth in the uh, grand list of subplots and that will be situated in the bottom right column so uh, what else? so you can see that after defining the subplot, we were basically repeating the same um, plotting method for each of the subplots, data creating, plotting, formatting, and then, then start again. And because the geography is the same uh, for all the files, we don't need to waste processing time by redefining the coordinate grid every time we add a subplot. And in fact, we are um, reusing the daily uh, two-dimensional two longitude and latitude mass grids from uh, our daily uh, map that we just saw above for the 20th of, of March. We don't really need to visualize all the, all the dates to get an idea of the daily evolution of phytoplankton. So here I have chosen for the dates uh, with um, better coverage, the, the best coverage. But you can easily, hopefully you will do it, uh, add uh, further subplots to the, to the code box to see the complete sequence in case you're interested. So as you can see, uh, for example, comparing these two plots over here, well, in, in general the four of them, the intensity and the location and the shape of the bloom can change quite a lot from day to day. In particular, for the 20th to the uh, uh, 31st of March, 
uh, we have persistent currents, so this one over here, that are picking uh, water as they go. So here they are picking up water with a high chlorophyll concentration for the 20th of March. And then if you go to the uh, 31st of March, the, the daily map for that, you can see that now the water that is picking up uh, is a lower, has all lower concentration and this has happened in only two days. And then we can have things as uh, currents changing shape completely. Uh, this is a case of, for example, this plume that is going off the uh, bottom eddy, that which is present in the four figures. And this might be caused uh, by an opposing current that's picking up some of the water in the body of the eddy. And again, as an exercise, you might want to identify the salinity and the uh, sea surface temperature products for these dates plot them using exactly the same subplot function we have used here and see if and how the changes in chlorophyll concentration match the physical dynamics, the salinity and the sea surface temperature dynamics of the region. So um, with this, we have a visual footprint of our phytoplankton bloom and a general idea of how it has evolved uh, with time. This is actually um, very useful information on, the, on its own. Uh, phytoplankton blooms are uh, crucial for the marine ecosystem because um, when you have um, a region with high levels of phytoplankton, you will be supporting a high abundance of uh, zooplankton, which will then support a, a bigger number of small fish and that's so on going up in the food chain. So obviously the next question uh, for this, from this perspective is can we pinpoint the exact extent of a phytoplankton bloom in one specific map? Or in other words, given a pixel location in the map, <clears throat> can we say if a phytoplankton bloom is happening? And there are several ways to do this. Obviously the easiest way will be to compare our, the values in our map to a predefined number, so that's easy enough. For example, and we can go back to our original map for the 20th of March, we can decide that every pixel with chlorophyll concentrations above, uh, let's say, 0.5 milligrams per cubic meter uh, are part of a phytoplankton bloom. This is very easy, but obviously it has some, some issues. So the problem with this is that the threshold that defines what chlorophyll concentration or high chlorophyll concentration is uh, depends a lot on when during the year and where in the globe we are. So in other words, if we use the wrong threshold, we can end up a map where all the pixels are flagged as phytoplankton blooms or none of them are. So something that works for the North Atlantic during winter might be completely useless as a threshold for the Western Mediterranean during spring. So, for example, talking about the Western Mediterranean, we have annual mean uh, values for chlorophyll around 0.3 milligrams per cubic meter, but we have regions where the values are much, much higher uh, during the uh, season where the, when the phytoplankton is, is growing. So, uh, if, as we suggested, we use 0.5 milligrams per cubic meter as a threshold to detect blooms in the Western Mediterranean during the phytoplankton growth season, the whole region can be flagged as an active bloom. So, we go back to our maps in here. So, for this reason, it's better to calculate the threshold, taking the account all the information available on a map using a statistics, in particular statistical me metrics such as the regional mean and the median. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the next uh, box, uh, in the next uh, list of code instructions. So to calculate the mean and the median, we will use the numpy uh, these two functions, not mean non mean and non, -p non mean median, sorry, uh, which are obviously both distributed within the non p module. Uh, very quickly remind you that uh, NAN, so N A N, is the acronym for not a number. Uh, so these values correspond with incorrect retrievals during clouds, for example, and are masked out of the data rate. 
So these uh, NumPy functions are very, very handy, very useful when you have a race where you know that there are going to be not a number of values. And if your um, data structure, the data array, uh, happens to be empty, so fully covered by not a number of values, you might get a warning saying that the, uh, the, the median and the mean cannot be computed. And that's one of the reasons why we have set up our environment to ignore warnings up there. So we use uh, both of those uh, metrics as uh, via the, the functions defined in NumPy, and we print the resulting values for these two. And as you can see, the median and values uh, and mean values uh, we obtain are in the same range and the same order of magnitude, and they're actually pretty pretty similar. Um, so. Um, if we go back to our genome map, we can see maybe why those values are so uh, so similar. So if you look at the map, uh, having a mean and a median that are almost the same is to be expected, because we can see that most of this region is covered by open ocean waters where the chlorophyll concentration is, is very low. So these low values are driving uh, the resultant mean uh, and median uh, values that are driving them down. Um, by computing the regional mean and the regional median, we might also be losing a lot of information about the extreme events. So this is similar to the effect of a temporal data aggregation that we saw in part one. And it's something that we will have to keep in mind when deriving and analyzing time series that we will do further down this exercise. So it's scrolling down. We can now um, use these metrics as thresholds to study the extent of the bloom. So in particular, we are going to um, see what happens if we use the median. And you can maybe try to use the mean at the end of, the, of, of this section and see what happens. So um, we first select the pixels that belong to the bloom using this threshold that we have just defined it as the median chlorophyll and region. And um, we do this using the numpy where function. We have used this function in part one to zoom into a region of the map and then use the resultant indexes to extract a box of data corresponding to certain coordinate limits. So when we did that in part one, we had multiple logical conditions that were imposed over the latitude and the log uh, longitude arrays which had a different shape that the array um, we wanted to subset. And here, on the other hand, um, the logical condition is performed over the daily chlorophyll variable, so we won't need to perform any transformation of the resulting indexes. We then create a LMT <coughs> an empty array in the same shape as a daily chlorophyll variable and we fill it up with zeros with this very handy numpy function called zeros and then in a very basic way we flag the pixels that belong to the bloom so basically we go and we manually change the values um, for the bloom array uh, that are uh, within the bloom from zero to one and finally we can plot uh, the extent of the bloom using this bloom array that we have just defined. Uh, as a bloom uh, array that we have in here has only two variables, zero and one, uh, plotting this using a full color map makes absolutely no sense. So instead of, of using um, this, for example, as, col as a color map, uh, we can uh, build a discrete color map using two fixed colors. So uh, we have chosen to use white and green in this particular case. And we define uh, the discrete color map using the listed color map method, which is distributed as part of the matplotlib color libraries we ported at the beginning. So this creates a color map uh, object called a uh, green color map, green C map, generated from that list of colors. And as an exercise, you can replicate this analysis using the mean chlorophyll, uh, uh, 
yeah, the mean chlorophyll we obtain above as a threshold instead of the median and see how the extent and the shape of the bloom changes with the threshold. But for the time being, let's see what happens when we use the median. So this is the final plot of the bloom extent. So basically the pixels in green uh, belong to the bloom and the pixels in white don't belong to, to, to the bloom. Um, so first thing, I mean, this is a massive area, uh, a massive block of, of green. So this, this looks highly suspicious. Um, clearly the chlorophyll values are very high in here, but the problem is that the decisions leading to the stress holes are quite delicate. So we need to choose the statistical metric and the region when we, where we apply it very well. For example, if we calculate this threshold for the whole Atlantic Ocean, both the mean and the median, will be much, much lower. And you end up with a lower threshold, which means uh, that the uh, range of chlorophyll values that belong to the bloom are going to be wider. So it's going to mean that more of this image is going to be flagged as, 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 chlorophyll, uh, as a chlorophyll bloom. <clears throat> Choosing the wrong uh, threshold can also lead for, to, to false uh, detections. Uh, in another sense, uh, for example, it's frequent to see, see uh, high chlorophyll values around coastal areas all year long. And this can be caused by high nutrients, for example, from, from our agriculture and other human activities um, that are carried down to the sea by uh, rivers or by the runoff uh, after the rains. But this can also be due to the chlorophyll retrieval algorithm failing due to the waters being too shallow, shallow and uh, being, having a high content in inorganic matter. In both cases, using an inadequate, inadequate uh, threshold will lead us to think we are looking at a bloom event when actually we are just in a region of consistently high chlorophyll concentration. So, um, all that say to fix, we clearly have an issue, and to fix this issue we need a way to decide if a value of chlorophyll, in this case, is normal or anomalous for a specific location. But how do we know what anomalous chlorophyll looks like? Again, there are different techniques to do this, and here we are going to use the quickest one, which is also one of the most efficient ones, uh, which is computing a climatology. So imagine that we can somehow establish a baseline, a reference value that describes the typical status of a biogeochemical variable for a certain region. Then a measure of the anomalous character of a value can be computed by subtracting this reference value from the observations. In the case of chlorophyll anomalies, this is usually done on a pixel by pixel basis because we have data arrays and we, it's usually an operation that we perform uh, in a log space. But a pretty similar operation can be performed on time series and in linear space. Um, the reference value for the uh, chlorophyll uh, climatology is typically extracted uh, from from uh, the climatology is built uh, as, a, as a baseline uh, value uh, calculated by averaging values over a certain period of time. Different temporal time windows uh, can be chosen depending on the application. So, for example, by computing an anomaly, we effectively remove the seasonal sign at each of the pixels while we are retaining, still retaining information on non-seasonal events uh, during that year. We can also have daily climatology. So daily climatologies provide a measure of the typical annual cycle and can be used to derive daily anomaly time series that reveal changes in the timing and amplitude of seasonal peaks. So in the next uh, few steps, we will try to build a map reference, uh, a map of reference values for the 20th of March in the form of a daily climatology. We will start by listing uh, all the files corresponding to the date of the year for the five years previous uh, to our bloom. So that's years uh, 1998 to 2002. So we define the list of files, we then load the data using the usual combination of X-ray open data set and variable assignment, 
and um, then we basically will have an array uh, that is an extraction of the daily chlorophyll array for each day. We have, we end up, in this case, we end up having five daily uh, chlorophyll arrays, one per year, and we need to put all the data together to facilitate uh, averaging. So to do this, we define a list object, uh, which uh, we are doing in here. This uh, list of arrays is called daily chlorophyll list uh, 20th of March. And uh, we will then use this list to stack the arrays. So we will go for from five two-dimensional chlorophyll arrays to a single 3D array, where the third dimension is built by pass, uh, pasting the two-dimensional arrays one after the other. So by stacking, we are basically adding a third dimension. In this case, it's a temporal dimension, we, which then we use to calculate the temporal average. And we do that uh, over here uh, using the numpy function called stack. As you can see, this function gets as an input um, the list of arrays, uh, one per uh, year that we are considering. And we also give it an index for the new axis. So that's over here um, as an argument. <clears throat> So remember that indexes in Python start at zero. So an axis a number set to two is actually indicating a third axis. I have uh, included some printing, some printing commands over here. So you can see how the shape uh, varies uh, before and after stacking. And finally, uh, using uh, the uh, numpy not a number mean function that we've used, the same that we used above, we can calculate our five year daily climatology. We have used this function before in the exercise, but note that uh, in the arguments, we are passing an extra argument um, that indicates which one of the three axes we are going to use to average the data. In other words, we are we're making sure in here by using this. Uh, syntax. We are making sure that we are averaging across the temporal dimensions, across the five years. We have uh, stored the climatology data in this variable and we can now uh, plot it using the same code sequence we have been using for the rest of the chlorophyll concentrations. And so it's basically literally the same uh, plotting sequence we have used above uh, for the daily and for the uh, weekly, uh, the week weekly uh, sequence of daily plots where we have a use about. So let's concentrate on on the results. That this is the daily climatology for the 20th of March obtained by aggregating five years of data. So as you can see, aggregating data for five different years increases the coverage and decreases the variability. So see, in comparison, the daily snapshot that we had for the 20th of March for 2003. So uh, this is an effect that we have seen uh, already when we compare the level three daily and level four monthly products in the previous exercise. And when we also reduce the daily map to a single daily average value when we were looking for a threshold early in this exercise, so the results uh, along the coast are especially revealing. Uh, most of the coast seems to have sustained uh, high chlorophyll concentrations uh, during the five years previous to your date of interest. Or in other words, uh, concentrations around one or as high as three milligrams per cubic meter are seem to be normal for the coastal regions uh, in this area. And these do not necessarily imply that a change in plant, uh, phytoplankton bloom is taking place. So we can now uh, put all, all these things that we have learned uh, to good use and build the corresponding anomaly map for the region for the 2000, uh, to 20th of March 2013 that matches this climatology map that we have generated in here. So that's what the next uh, data uh, code sequence is, is going gonna, is gonna to help you do. Um, to do this, actually, the, the actual operation of, of a computer now, an anomaly is, is very simple. We only need to subtract the reference climatology values from the daily chlorophyll mean values on a pixel by pixel uh, basis. And this will give you uh, give us a measure of how anomalous uh, our original data for the 20th of March 2013 values were and help us decide if the chlorophyll values 
we saw the representa bloom or not. So this is exactly what we are doing uh, in this first two lines of code. We first reload the chlorophyll value, the daily chlorophyll value to be safe in case we have rewritten the variable somewhere uh, above. And then we uh, subtract the climate of year array from the daily average array and store it in a resultant anomaly, uh, which uh, variable which we call daily chlorophyll anomaly for the 20th of March. Finally, we can use this new variable to plot the anomaly map using a pretty similar code sequence, uh, similar what we've been using for the rest of the chlorophyll observation. In this particular case, the only change is the choice of color map. Uh, in this particular case, we have selected a blue, white, red color map, which is called BWR for short, which is what we call a diverging color map. Um, these diverging color maps have two major color components, in this case, blue and red. And then the values in the map transition from one of the color components to the other by passing through uh, a non-saturated color, so usually yellow or white. And we are we have we are using white in this particular case. So diverging color maps are typically used to represent magnitudes that change um, sign halfway through the color bar, uh, as the climate as the anomaly does. And if we scroll down, we have already produced um, our anomaly map. So areas in blue mean that the daily average values for the 20th of March 2013 were lower than the climatological, climatological values. And the red areas mean exactly the opposite. The daily average values were higher than those on the climatology. Um, the anomaly map reveals that for this date and region, the most anomalous values are actually found along the coast over here rather than within the offshore phytoplankton bloom that uh, started this analysis in the first place. And this is actually uh, quite a surprising result. Uh, we also know that this area in the northwest African coast is, is subject to a strong uh, coastal upwelling. And this is characterized by vertical transport of cold water that are really high in nutrients. And this, as you know, favor uh, the growth of phytoplankton. So this means that we can expect consistently high chlorophyll values on these areas under upwelling conditions. But the fact that such a strong positive anomaly is detected along the coast for this year suggests that there, uh, the presence of an upwelling favorable uh, wind stress event for this stage in 2003. So again, I will bring back uh, uh, the idea of comparing these this chlorophyll maps with their counterparts for sea surface temperature and salinity. SST in particular is a great indicator of coastal upwelling and uh, the variability near the shore. Uh, so once again, I will encourage you to obtain the sea surface temperature products for the relevant dates. Uh, maybe compute a, cl a climatology in the same way that we've done for the chlorophyll compute the uh, anomaly map and see if there is any correlation between the SST and the chlorophyll anomalies. So we have said that uh, different temporal windows can be chosen um, depending on the application. For example, by computing an annual anomaly, we effectively remove the uh, seasonal cycle at each grid point. Uh, and um, we retain important events during the year. In fact, as I mentioned during the presentation, we provide annual chlorophyll anomalies for the global and regional oceans as part of the Copernicus Marine Ocean Monitoring Indicators. And, um, and you can access that through the, through the um, catalog in the same way you do the ocean color products, but those are only available on the annual mode and just for the last year. So for example, we are now in 2020, so the catalog includes the anomaly map for the global ocean and the regional oceans for 2019. So for the last section of this exercise, we will put together a range of time series of chlorophyll concentrations to gain some understanding about the phytoplankton seasonal cycle. As with anomalies, uh, time series can be assembled at different temporal and spatial resolutions that are suitable for different applications. And we have now seen several times that temporal aggregation increases the coverage, the amount of data available, but has a smoothing effect, which might lead to information loss. 
So uh, this is temporal aggregation. If we talk about the spatial aggregation instead of temporal aggregation, we have to bear in mind that data can be extracted at particular locations, but for extended regions to be a time series. If we have an extended region, uh, we will need to compute regional uh, mean values by performing an average. Uh, and you, you might need to weight uh, that average using the pixel area uh, over the area of interest. Um, so let's uh, first see a reminder of uh, how to extract a subspatial, sub, uh, a special subset of the data. So for the seasonal cycle, the area of interest will be the coastal and self uh, regions of the Atlantic Ocean, where we saw our phytoplankton bloom in the previous section. And in here we have defined uh, the bounding values for the corresponding uh, coordinate box. We will reload uh, the daily chlorophyll level 3 product <coughs> for um, the 20th of March 2013, again to be safe in case we have lost this variable somewhere. Then we will use the numpy where function to identify the parts of the arrays that are inside the coordinate box and which ones are outside. As happened last time we did it, and these two functions will return two dimensional variables. Um, that uh, need to be converted uh, back to vectors. And then uh, finally, we will start the zoom in data for the original monthly data, daily data, apologies, by replacing the columns, so the columns we had initially um, uh, in the, um, when we access these variables, uh, and using instead the subset of latitude and longitude indexes. And here I've plotted a quick reminder of what the zoomed in area looks like and how the chlorophyll looks like for the 20th of March 2013. And I've used a slightly different color map to make things more exciting. So this is our region of interest. And for this region, we will be interested in building a time series of monthly regional average values. So scrolling down. To do this, we will have to extract this box from each monthly file during uh, 2003 calculate the average value with the box, and plot the resulting time series. So we will do, uh, then we will do the same using the daily composites for March. And finally, we will compare the two time series. So previously, when we wanted to study uh, the same product for a list of dates, uh, we will list the files and load the files manually, one by one. We did that for the two by two uh, time series, not time series. Um, data sequence uh, to see the effect of plankton bloom evolution. But obviously, uh, this is not very convenient. So the longer the time period we are interested in, the more inconvenient this method is. Just imagine having uh, to list and open all the daily files in a month one by one. So what we are going to do here is to use a shortcut which will allow us to create a file list. Then we will loop all over the files in the list and operate on them sequentially. So to do this, um, we will use a Python control structure called a for loop. So that's uh, the for loop, the start of the for loop. And this is used for iteration over a sequence. In this case, it's a range of, of numbers that goes from uh, 1 to 12 and that represent the different, the different months. So what are the statements that are going to be inside a loop? Well, as we, as I said, uh, we're going to first uh, try to build a monthly time series. So we will use this loop to create a file list of monthly files for 2003. And then we will start extract the time series data from uh, each one of those files. We have initialized a monthly um, file list here. As an empty list, and we will also build a twin list of monthly data sets, which will come in handy for plotting our time series. So, how do we define the monthly files that need to be added to this monthly files list? For that, I need to scroll a little bit up and select uh, this, uh, this uh, definition in here. Um, in here, we have defined a reference pattern. Uh, for monthly file names by making use of uh, the phytoplankton strict template function. Uh, Python allows us to define string templates with two types of components, fixed fields and variable fields. So in here we have defined a string template called monthly template where the year and the month are variable fields. 
So we can now go back to our loop. The loop will be executed for month values up uh, 1, 2, 3, up to 12 for each uh, numerical value of this variable m. Uh, which increases with every iteration, we will define the equivalent string, uh, string uh, called current month. And this is done by converting m, which is a number, the number m over here, um, to uh, a string, a two character string using the string filling function called uh, zero fill. So that, that value, that uh, function over there. Once the current month has been defined, so we have to find this variable, we use the substitute function, so that function over there, uh, with the monthly template to define a filing for the current month. So the substitute function performs the template substitution. So it returns a new string called current file name, uh, where the field year has been uh, replaced by the current year variable and the field month has been replaced by the current month variable. We would then use uh, what we call the globe function for the, from the globe model to retrieve the corresponding monthly file. So the globe uh, function finds all the path names matching a specified pattern. In our case, this is the current file name. So this is the pattern over here. Um, and if such a file exists, we will, so that's uh, the if the file exists a structure, we will then append, using this method, uh, the file name, the current file name, to the list of valid files that we have initialized as an empty list at the beginning. The whole operation is, as you can see, controlled by the Python if-else structure, so we also uh, can print uh, a message saying that we have found the file and if the file doesn't does not exist then the commands under the else uh, section are executed and here we are only printing a message saying that we haven't found been able to find the file and finally you can have a look at the lists that we have just created by printing the monthly files and monthly dates variables so now all the hard work is done. We don't have, no longer have to um, manually write the file names and the paths for all the files and all the data sets we want to use. So um, now that we file list is ready, we can loop through it, opening each one of the files, and we load the chlorophyll, we extract it, we compute the mean, and then we, at the end of it, we will have the chlorophyll time series, the monthly time series for the chlorophyll concentration. So we initialize the time series to an empty list. We can then loop through the monthly file list, opening one of each one of these files using the regular open dataset function. We load uh, the corresponding chlorophyll value. We uh, are extracting the relevant box of the data using this uh, indexes. And finally, we, can, we are um, calculating the regional monthly average value here, which we then append to the time series. Here you can see the time series we have just created. So it's basically a list of values, one per month of 2003. And for uh, we can extract values from that list. So for example, uh, for uh, March, uh, we just extract the third uh, value in order uh, within the chlorophyll monthly mean time series, and that basically can be assigned to the uh, chlorophyll monthly mean for March 2003. So finally, and this is almost the end of the exercise, we can plot the time series and see how the chlorophyll concentration changes from month to month during the 2013 in the region. So the plotting sequence is slightly different from the map plotters that we have used in the past. And here we are introducing two ways of, of plotting data. So there's the plot uh, function and the scatter function. The plot function uh, can be useful to plot a continuous line, so those black lines, such as this one and this one. And we use the scatter function to plot the actual points, so one point per month uh, for all for the whole year. So 
using those two labels and then a set of formatting options we reach this this uh, plot for the monthly chlorophyll concentration time series for 2003 and this summarizes very well the average phytoplankton seasonal cycle during, during <clears throat> 2003 as you can see the uh, cycle showcases peaks uh, or blooms in spring and uh, during summer early uh, autumn the second bloom completely dominates over the first in both intensity and duration so it's duration and intensity um, similar uh, seasonal variations are present in many other regions of the globe um, with time series typically characterized by five to plant uh, growing periods occurring at different times of the year and differences in seasonal cycles are always observed between open ocean and coastal waters which frequently present more than one growing period so you end up with multiple peaks so so from from variables such as this one that present uh, a distinct seasonality uh, annual cycles can be extracted from the original signal and we can decisionalize the time series by subtracting the seasonal cycle from the original signal and then fit the remaining signal to a linear regression to obtain a linear trend and finally, we will use all these tools together uh, with daily composites from March 2003 to build a daily time series over the month, we which then compare with, uh, which then will be compared uh, with the monthly time series. Uh, in the same way we did above, we firstly uh, define a daily template for the daily files um, file names. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the year, the month, and the uh, are. Uh, viable fields. We define the year and the month we're interested in. So in here, um, we then initialize our daily file list variable here as an empty file list. And we will also build a twin list of daily dates in the same way we did for the monthly dates. The daily uh, for loop, which is this one over here, will be now executed for day values from 1, 2, 3, up to uh, 31. For each uh, numerical value of the, val of the variable D, which is a number, we can obtain a corresponding string uh, filled up uh, up to two characters using the zero fill uh, function of the string module, and then we can assign the resulting string to the date uh, variable. Then, as we did for the monthly data set, we can use the substitute data set. So we will replace year, month, and day for the, with the actual values uh, that we have defined within the loop. Um, we then will use the glow function uh, to retrieve the corresponding file name for the daily composite. So this is how we do this. If the file exists, we use the append method to add it to the file uh, list. And if it doesn't, we only print uh, a warning or a informative message saying that we couldn't find uh, the list. <coughs> So um, once uh, the daily file uh, list is ready, we use exactly the same structure we did for the monthly uh, time series to put together a time series of regional daily average. So daily average can be uh, daily data can be quite patchy, as we saw in the first exercise. So when we um, extract uh, our data, we can end up with partially empty arrays. So we basically build the chlorophyll times the daily mean chlorophyll time series in the same way as the monthly and then we can see here how the chlorophyll concentration change from day to day during march 2003 in the region so as you can see here we have one missing value that means that for uh, February 2003 uh, the data coverage is so bad that the mean value over uh, the region is not a number. Um, then finally, we can use um, uh, the scatter and the plot functions over here to draw the data points and to draw the lines that connect the data points. So these are the same uh, functions we use for the monthly time series. We have an extra function which is called hlines, 
which we have used to create a, a red line, a horizontal red line, um, to reference what uh, we had as the mean uh, value for March 2003, uh, as obtained from the monthly uh, composite. So we can compare how the daily values vary along that uh, across that line. And um, the response in the North Atlantic ranges from cyclical uh, to decadal uh, oscillations. So basically what you have here is day-to-day -day, uh, observations. And comparing this daily and monthly time series plus, you can begin to understand the trade-off between coverage and resolution of processes. So that's the seasonal versus the event scale that must be considered when choosing a data set. So as I was saying, uh, we can do the same uh, for the whole North Atlantic. And we provide this, again, as an ocean monitoring indicator through Copernicus Marine Service Catalog. And uh, the response in the North Atlantic uh, is quite cyclical uh, and is therefore of critical importance to monitor the chlorophyll concentrations of, at both daily and monthly and annual uh, temporal resolutions and also different specialist case to be, to be able to separate the um, seasonal cycle, the seasonal signal from the uh, on uh, year to year variation from the long term trends. Uh, in particular, we do that for the uh, ocean monitor indicators. Uh, we are showing in here, so in blue, the dots are the daily regional average uh, weighted by pixel area. Then we have uh, this seasonalized time series in green and the linear trend in blue. And we, with this type of time series, we can also monitor the phenology, for example, of the annual phytoplankton blooms. So uh, monitor the start date, the duration and intensity of the phytoplankton bloom in the North Atlantic. Um, the techniques we have learned in here can be applied to almost every biogeochemical variable in the Copernicus Marine Catalog. In particular, if you want to spend a little bit more time in this section, you can try to produce the corresponding anomaly map and uh, time series for the primary production data set that I suggested and kind of introduced at the end of the previous exercise and see how the anomaly and the uh, time series correlate to chlorophyll anomalies in chlorophyll time series. I really hope that you are enjoying the practical session so far. Well done for reaching the end of part two, and I will see you again in a minute in the third and final exercise. Bye.